Hello, hello. How is everybody? So excited. I've got my Instagram over here and my Facebook over here. Just waiting for everything to connect and I think we're doing well. Awesome. All right, everyone. Welcome again. Um, hello, hello. I'm just going to hop right into it and get started. I have, if you are watching me on Facebook right now, I have put in the description my work cited. So if at any point you want to take a peek, read along, it's all there for you. Instagram watchers, if you want to follow on, follow along on my work cited, um, the evidence I'm about to give you, please do so um, following the link in my bio. I put it right in my, my link tree. So it's right there for if you want to follow along. Although I'm sure that would be kind of difficult on Instagram. Anyways, let's get started. I've got my hellos and welcomes and my outline here. So you're going to see me look down a few times and I apologize. Um, this live is about the COVID vaccines. I have a, I'll get into it in a little bit, but I have a very unique background and I have felt super um, responsible and had a profound sense of obligation for speaking to the vaccines and, and their, their importance. And hey, Taryn, excited for this too. Um, and so I, anyway, science grounded, spirit led, that's who I am. You'll learn more about that. This live is meant for those people who are on the fence. Those who, think they want the vaccine, but maybe are seeing misinformation out there and want to know what's misinformation, what's true, what isn't. I don't know anything anymore. I'm getting confused. This is meant to set the record straight for you. And also, you will also leave with ways to find your own evidence, reputable resources. I'm going to teach you how to find reputable resources and how to find out if what you're watching, if what you're seeing is a reputable resource. Okay, I'm going to ask a few ground rules here. I'm going to ask that any comments be kept kind. This is not a place for hecklers, for hasslers, for arguments. Um, I will actually not be looking at the comments from here on out. It's a little distracting and I wanna stay with this. I will address comments and questions post live at my discretion. Um, okay, so today is meant to Oh, let me back up. So I'm Angelica, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me. I am. I have a background as a physician assistant. I keep my certifi certification and my license current. I have experience in primary care, in sleep medicine, and actually in integrative medicine. So if you're not familiar with the word integrative medicine, it is a place where individuals can go to not only get Western-based Medica medicine and medications therapies, but can also receive alternative therapies. So I would recommend Reiki, I would recommend essential oils, but I would also give out antibiotics. So really both worlds, which my heart of hearts tells me that both wor worlds can coexist and actually complement the other when used properly. Um, with my science degree, I actually, so I have my master's and as a physician assistant, I have a master's also in liberal studies with a concentration in the natural sciences, which actually I had to do my own, had to do my, my own research and, and almost, I didn't get to publish it, but I wrote my own master's thesis, did all my own statistics, all of that stuff. Um, Heather, yes, quickly, this will be available all the time and I will actually be putting this on my podcast as well. So yes, you feel free to share. Um, all right, within my science background, I have taken, I had to count, I had to think back just now. I had to take six research methods courses, one of which I taught. So I am really, really quite good at not only vetting sources, um, determining which ones are reputable, but reading them at that. All those statistical analyses, you see Fisher's exact, two way P cited, I've done them, I know how to do them, and it's, it's not easy. So. Um, that being said, I am also Reiki certified, EFT certified. I read the Akashic records. I am a life coach. I had a home birth. <laughs> I ate my placenta. I am delaying my vaccination, not my vaccination. I'm delaying the vaccination schedule of my son. Everything I do, every big decision that I make is evidence-based. Do I love smudging? Yes. Do I love essential oils? Uh-huh. 
all the big decisions I make, again, are evidence-based, including those decisions I have for my son. So I hope to impart this knowledge on you today. I also want to share that personally, I have had many tragedies in my life. So, I mean, I'm talking like weird stuff, house fires, and I've been in an amusement park accident, car accidents. We lost two pools when I was a kid, like really weird shit. So I respect risk taking. And I understand risk versus benefit on a personal level. And we'll go through risk benefit in, in the future. Today is meant to serve as a basic overview. I'm going to touch cell biology. I'm going to touch a little bit of mechanism of action of the vaccines. I'm going to touch pharmacology a little bit. I cannot possibly give you eight years of science education in one hour, and I'm gonna to try to keep it to one hour. I know I've been talking for seven already, so points given away to Gryffindor, um, or get taken from Gryffindor. Today, we're going to go over vaccine ingredients and how the, what those ingredients are, why are they in there, how they work, how the vaccines work, they're what we call their mechanism of action. Fertility in the vaccine, does it, do the vaccines affect fertility? What do we have currently, what evidence do we have enlightening that question? Microchipping, what can we say about that? Herd immunity, what the frick is it? Why do we call ourselves cows? And how we achieve herd immunity? Like I said, we're going to talk about risk versus benefit. We're just going to touch on that a little bit and how getting your vaccine is really a case of risk versus benefit for you personally and for the population as a whole. <clears throat> Herd immunity. Then we're also going to talk about types of biases. Whenever, let's just say I, 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 will, I will teach you, I'm not going to teach you, I'm going to push you through self-forgiveness because Yes, this vaccine is very heated. It's, it's a hot topic. There is freedom of choice currently, but we need to talk about how our biases impact others and have the ripple effect on others. And like I said, I am going to teach you how to find and vet your own sources. So many people have been sending me screenshots. So many people have been sending me podcast episodes, documentaries, videos. Those are not evidence-based resources. So I'm gonna teach you how to find them, what counts, and maybe if we have a little bit of time, I'll teach you how to read scientific articles. That might be fun. Okay, awesome. So I've got my little whiteboard here. We are going to have a little bit of cell biology. And from here on out, guys, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I am not gonna pay attention to the comments just because I wanna keep it, keep it short and to the point. So let's go back to cell biology. All right, so I am going to draw a cell for you. We are going to draw uh, the nucleus, right? We all know what the nucleus is. That's where DNA is housed. And I'm going to draw something outside of the nucleus called a ribosome. This is where DNA is, and this is a ribosome. Okay, so I'll show you a quick picture, and then I'm going to draw another one. This is for my Facebook people for my Instagram people. Is that, so in, in, uh, Instagram does things backwards, so I'm sorry, but here's the nucleus and that's where DNA is, and here are the ribosomes. Do you remember what ribosomes do? They make proteins. Do you remember why we need proteins? Because they do everything in our body. We need proteins to survive, to live, okay? Cool, awesome. Now, going back, we're gonna zoom in on what's called the cell membrane, right where I, in my little square there, okay? What does a cell membrane look like? And this is super oversimplified because if I wanted to spend three hours on the cell membrane, I could. I took cell biology in college. The microscopes on a Friday morning were tough my senior year. Okay, so inside of that cell membrane is my Instagram things not lighting up anymore, is what's called a phospholipid bilayer. So it's made up of hydrophilic, meaning water-loving heads, on, right in the 
right outside of the cell and inside the cell. And those little tail things there, those are called um, lipid something. They're fatty acids, all right? So, and they are hydrophobic, right? Afraid of water. So they tend to make this the shape. The whole membrane is composed of this phospholipid bilayer. It protects the cell. It makes sure certain things get in and certain things don't get in. At least that's its basic form. Certain things that can get in and out need to be accompanied by, often need to be accompanied by some sort of buffer. And we'll talk about buffers in a second. So th something like, let's say sugar, right? Cells love sugar. I love sugar. Sugar is going to be easily passable through the phospholipid bilayer. <clears throat> There may be sugar in the vaccine. So, we got it? Awesome? Cool. All right, so, Angelica, we talked about how important proteins are. Do we just get it for meat or do we make them? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. We make them. We make them too. Mm -hmm. So, how do we make them? Put it simply, our DNA says we need to make, we are, we get a message to our DNA, and this can be a whole nother topic, that says we need to make a protein to serve this purpose. DNA says, okay, it unzips with the proper enzymes. Unzips, because remember, DNA, this isn't very important for our topic today, but, and I'm not going to do a very good job, right? DNA is like this, this cool little spindle thingy. So it unzips, and then it's got, remember those A, T, C, G back in, in biology? So you get the A and the T and the C and the G and maybe another T and an A over here, those codes. Mr. mRNA, oh wait, mRNA sounds familiar. This is important. mRNA comes over and says, ooh, I'm going to make a copy of this portion of the DNA that has the code, sorry Instagram folks, that has the code for the protein we need to make. It's sort of like the best metaphor I can come up with right now, or analogy, is when you go to a restaurant. The DNA is the menu. You get to pick what protein you want. Do you want steak? Do you want chicken? Maybe shark is on the menu today. You pick your protein, right, from the DNA. mRNA. The waiter comes over and says, oh, I see you are picking from our filet mignon and your sides will be mashed potato and vegetable. Then the mRNA goes to outside of, so the mRNA goes outside of the DNA, outside of, excuse me, outside of the, the nucleus, and heads over to the ribosome, aka protein station, right? AKA the kitchen, talks to the chefs. And says, the wait staff, mRNA, says, hey, chef, can you make, this is kind of challenging to be on both screens at once. Hey, chef, table number 11 wants a filet mignon with potatoes and the, the seasonal vegetable of the day. And the ribosome, the chef says, sure thing. Here it is. Here's your protein. That's how that works. Cool. Awesome. Okay. I won't be able to answer questions live, but if you do have questions, please put them in the comments and I can address them later. So super simplified version of what's going on in your body. Way more, way more, but this is what you need to know for now. So does Pfizer, does Moderna, do they change your DNA? Because I have seen that rumor being spread. It is a very bad high school rumor. Here is how, I'm gonna erase this. Here is how, here's how, first of all, here's how, how do I wanna say this? Here's a little bit about COVID first, and you've heard this before. So here's COVID, it's got, and this is any virus by the way, it's got something called spike proteins. Ah, virus. Virus, ah, uh, here it comes, right? Okay, these things are called spike proteins. Wait a second, we just learned about how proteins are made. Cool. What if there was a way for us to teach our immune system how to make a certain protein 
that is viral without being exposed to the virus? Ooh, we can, and in a, in a few different ways, but we're gonna cover two today. So the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, they have created their own mRNA that is, so mRNA being the wait staff, the wait staff is carrying the message to the chef, to the ribosome, right? So the mRNA wait staff is carrying the protein, the order for the spike protein specific to COVID into the cells. So Moderna and Pfizer have mRNA in them. Remember, the mRNA typically leaves the nucleus, but if it's already existing, it does not need to be in the nucleus, right? So it's just, it's floating around in the cy cytoplasm until it reaches the ribosome. And what happens is the ribosome then makes the spike protein. Sorry, Instagram folks. Makes the spike protein without having the virus itself. Does that make sense? Is that making sense? I'm gonna ask you guys. Okay, perfect, spike protein. So really we're using, yes, we are using our bodies as a way to express the spike protein so that our immune system recognizes the spike protein. We are literally giving our bodies, it's sort of like um, if you're gonna send a search dog for somebody who's lost. You don't say, go find them. You give them their scent, right? So this, the mRNA vaccines are giving our immune system the scent. So that if we do end up having the COVID virus in our bodies, it's, kind of, it, it's already prepped to find it. It ma mates, matches that scent. Cool, cool, awesome. All right, so let's go over ingredients because I've seen a lot of things about ingredients that I'm not too happy about. Um, all right, bum, bum, bum. let me make sure I covered everything. RNA spray immune system responses. Cool. Uh, ingredients. Here we go. Got it. Pfizer, mRNA, lipids. Why do we need lipids? Lipids, remember, are fatty acids. Fats. In fact, if you if you're an adult and you've gotten a lipid panel, they look at your cholesterol. Fats. Okay. Lipids. Why would we need them in a vaccine? It's actually to protect the mRNA because it's such. Um, it requires such a, uh, it's very spe specific to its environment. It needs a very controlled environment, so it helps protect them. Potassium chloride? What the hell is that? Monobasic potassium phosphate. Sodium chloride salt. Dibasic sodium phosphate dehydrate. Those are all what we call buffers, okay? Buffer means that it keeps what is inside the vaccine similar pH to that of your blood. So that when you get the vaccine, it doesn't hurt like a mother. So that it maintains the, the, the active ingredient, the mRNA, it keeps it stable. And in the, in the case of sucrose, which is also in the Pfizer vaccine, helps the active ingredient, the, the mRNA, get into the cell. Because remember, we have that phospholipid bilayer and not everything can get into the cell. So sucrose helps the uh, mRNA travel. The lipids are kind of like its shell to keep it safe. And the buffers make it so it's not uncomfortable as fuck for you to get the vaccine. Okay. That's Pfizer. Moderna, believe it or not, looks very similar. Okay, mRNA. Cool, awesome. Lipids. All oh, right, that's right. It, it protects. It protects the mRNA. Now these are some weird words, Angelica. Tromethamine. Tromethamine hydrochloride. Acetic acid. Sodium acetate trihydrate. Guess what those are? Buffers. Other types of buffers. Cool. And you know what, these things exist in other things that our body has been exposed to. So that's helpful. Oh, and look, sucrose is also in Moderna and Fi Moderna, just like it is in Pfizer, because we need, it'd be, it would, this vaccine would be totally useless if it did not have a way to pass through the phospholipid bilayer. 
So we attach sucrose to make that happen. So that's Pfizer and Moderna. J&J is a different story. J&J, Johnson & Johnson, um, they use a little bit older technology. So instead of induce, introducing an mRNA or a, a protein making, spike protein making um, dossier, it actually, so they put the DNA of the virus within, a, within another virus that is typically um, not, I shouldn't say typically, it will always not be something our bodies would react to. But it has to be a virus that we have not yet been exposed to because if we introduce a virus to our bodies, we're gonna in induce, um, it, if we introduce something to our bodies that we've already been exposed to, our immune system's gonna bash it and then it won't have any chance to, to get into um, the DNA and, and viral producing, uh, spike producing things. So it's the same idea. We want to, we want our, we are using our cells to express parts of this virus using this J and J modality. So very confusing. Let me back up a little bit. We have a very, so in J and J they're using in a chimpanzee adenovirus which is a con like your common, common cold, um, but for chimpanzees. Likely, you have not been exposed to chimpanzee adenovirus, so that's why they use it. So then your body has, has a way. So we've got adenovirus here. And inside the adenovirus, we've got the COVID DNA. So this adenovirus actually does invade our cells. Doesn't really have an effect on us and then goes through that same process. So when we do things like that, when we have Pfizer and Moderna and we have the mRNA, the, using the mechanism of action of mRNA, we're actually skipping a lot of steps. And when we need to get our boosters, which we will, I can save that and that talk for another, another live, J&J is going to have to come up with a whole new different virus for those who receive the J&J because now not only did you introduce this COVID DNA, but you, you also introduced the adenovirus DNA, and our immune systems are going to be already on high alert for that. All right. Cool. So mechanism of action. Oh, sorry. Yep. J&J. &J. Now we're going to talk about the J&J &J ingredients. I just forget. Adenovirus expressing spike protein. Check. We just covered that. Citric acid, citric acid monohydrate, trisodium citrate dihydrate, ethanol, I did not write this whole thing down, HBCD. It actually, um, uh, what did I write down here? It helps with solubility. Okay, we talked about, well, we haven't talked about it yet. We'll talk about it soon. And polysorbate, okay, and sodium chloride. Buffers, as you can imagine. Again, so it doesn't sting and so that it pass, easily passes through into our cells. Okay, how are we doing? We're we doing good. If you remember back in high school, isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic, those buffers have a, a, a role in that too. Happy to go into that in the comments if needed, but I'm gonna stay, try to stay on schedule here. 124, kicking ass. Okay, awesome. Ingredients, check. Bum, bum, bum. What is next? We did a mechanism of action. Yep, so long story short, they do not alter your DNA. They cannot. Cool? Awesome. What can actually, and there has been studies, is EFT. <laughs> so if you like tapping, but you're against the vaccine, because of the, it alters your DNA, actually the EFT does. And I'm, I, that is not a source I put in my work cited, but if you really want it, I'll go find it for you. Okay, cool. Moving right along, what's next? Fertility. So what's important to, so I found a few resources here. A lot of people have say, are saying, how can you, we know about fertility since there have not been any long-term studies? How can, I, I'm gonna turn that back on you. How can we know that it is affecting fertility without long-term studies? For men, I'm going to go over some, some ways in which 
COVID actually affects your fertility. And then I'll be diving into a study that I found as far as COVID vaccines not affecting fertility in women. Okay, so there was a great study in 2020. And actually, I shouldn't say study. It was a review of all the possible ways that COVID could actually affect male fertility. So remember our phospholipid bilayer? And I said it was very picky about what it lets in and what it lets out. I'm like mean girls and you've got to have certain things you got to be hydrophilic in order to be let in okay sometimes we need things to come in that are too big to go through the phospholipid bilayer and sometimes we need things that aren't hydrophilic to go through the hydro to the go through the phospholipid bilayer so i'm going to draw this phospholipid bilayer again i'm going to keep the cell because just in case i need to you know do that again. We're gonna make the little lipid tails. Okay, almost done, almost done. Okay, there's our phospholipid bilayer part of the cell membrane. Sometimes we need bigger things to go in. So you remember receptors? Occasionally there'd be some kind of channel, receptor or channel, that bypasses that phospholipid bilayer and is very specific. Again, this is all basic stuff. I could do a whole nother lesson on it, but I'm just gonna stick to this for now. There is, when it comes to COVID specifically, there is, this is how it gets into your body. There's a channel, a receptor called the ACE2 receptor. It is in the angiotensin cascade fancy word for part of the way your body controls your blood pressure. Again, I'm sorry, Instagram, everything's backwards. So I hope you're really good at reading backwards. This receptor is how, is what the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. There's a lot of coronaviruses, that is true. There's SARS-CoV-1, remember SARS, there's mers cov Remember MERS? We're talking about SARS-CoV-2 right now. This is how the spike protein goes into that channel. Okay, and that's how, and what happens is that COVID goes into your cells this way. Hold on, doing things backwards here. Through this receptor, into the DNA, and hijacks your DNA so that your, your body becomes viral shedding. You're a giant walking COVID factory. Okay. Anyways, where are those ACE? Those ACE2 receptors are not everywhere. Okay. You can imagine they are in the places where blood pressure is worked on. That's not a very good word. I've been out. I, mom brain. Okay. Things like kidneys. So when you read these scientific articles, it's interesting because a lot of the funding came from the, the kidney found, National Kidney Foundation because of this receptor. Fun fact, something you maybe you didn't know. Kidneys, heart, where's my other one? Kidneys, heart, GI tract, and this I'll have to look into, but I was going to go down the rabbit hole if I did, did too soon. Testicles. There are ACE2 receptors in testicles. Why? I don't know. So in 2020, there was a case, not a case review, but a, a, an article, and I put that in my work cited, all about the, how having this ACE2 receptor in the testicles could potentially make it so that men who contracted COVID had fertility concerns later, okay? So that's what that article was about. An article in 2021, also in my work cited, actually looked at 415 COVID-19 patients, or hold on, what do I want to say? They looked at men who had died with coronavirus, various ages, for I think 40 to, to 80, somewhere around there. Um, and they looked, they looked at their testicles and they looked under the microscope and they found not only was there SARS-CoV-2 in the testicles, but there was almost a complete germ cell loss. What's a germ cell? Sperm. There was a complete sperm loss. COVID was there. Again, correlation, causation. Likely because of COVID. So, 
as far as men are concerned. Yeah, there's no long-term studies on how the vaccines affect fertility for men. But there's, oh, there is quite a bit of alarming evidence that COVID itself is going to affect fertility in men. I will leave it at that. Draw your conclusions as you will. Okay. Women. Again, there are no long-term studies suggesting it affects your fertility. There are no long-term studies suggesting that it doesn't. There are hints. So I did find one study, also in my work cited, and they were, it was, it took place at a fertility clinic. Oh, how perfect. <laughs> and they looked at women, the women, I think, it was a very small sample size. And we'll talk about that um, later. But when we have a small sample size, it's not reflective of the population as a whole, right? Because that fertility clinic could have existed in a white middle class suburbia. It could have existed in Seattle. It could have existed in Ho Dunk, New York town with corn fields, right? So it, it may not be reflective. It's not going to be reflective as of the population as a whole. Another reason not to, a little segue here, another reason not to fear the vaccine, it, it, it's the mo literally the most studied vaccine we have ever had in human history and the most humans getting a vaccine at once. So the data that you're seeing, if evidence-based, again, I'll cover that, is highly more like, is very close to our population as a whole, reflective of our population as a whole. Okay. So anyways, this study was done in a fertility clinic. I think the, the subject size was 45, so very small. Which was, what was really cool is that all of the women did not have the vaccine. And then they studied the women who chose to get the vaccine versus not. So the women themselves were actually their own self-control. Remember, we need an experimental group and a control group, right? To say, this was the difference. So they actually served as their own control, which is very helpful because there's a lot of things that we cannot control when we study humans. Happy to go into that further if you need to. And they found that those who were able to conceive or produce embryos, right? So there was different levels of what they considered fertility. Again, this article is in my work cited. Was actually no different post vaccine versus pre-vaccine. The number of failed attempts to conceive, to produce embryos, was no different in those who received the vaccine and those who didn't. Again, very small sample size, and that's what I was able to find. But there's also no studies, very limited study. I haven't actually found any. If you find one, please, please put it in the comments so then I can read it as well. Um, to suggest that it does impact fertility. We'll talk about soon experience versus evidence. All right, fertility, check. Look at that, I did that in 10 minutes. Go me. All right, what's next here? Microchipping. Let's have a talk, guys. I did put a um, source for microchipping. It is, not, it is my one not evidence-based source. It was from the Atlantic, but I thought it had very thought-provoking questions, which may make it make you realize if you if you are concerned that there's microchips, make you think about that twice. Put the critical thinking cap on. How big are microchips? The current 5G chips are the size of a penny. The current needles required to inject the vaccines are larger than a penny. The vaccine requires it be injected intermuscularly, which means through your skin, through the fat, into your muscle, and into your bloodstream. I don't think microchips work if they're not at the surface. If they were to do microchips, if they happen to be small enough to fit through needles. 
keep in mind that when they are giving you these vaccines, they are pre-drawing from a vial. Each vial can inject, vaccinate six individuals. The injections are not pre-filled syringes. So that makes it harder to draw up microchips. I think this, this guy in this article did the math. In order to have 95% certainty that you would be drawing up a microchip, you would need 26 microchips in one vial. That just doesn't seem efficient, and it also seems very expensive, especially when they're already tracking us with their phones and easy passes. Um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, and then the great thing was, the, the one thing he pointed out is how is it going to stay powered in your body? And how is it going to be maintained? So just, from, just some thoughts for reflection. All right, herd immunity. I really wish they didn't use herd immunity. It makes it sound like cows and sheep, which is a very common reference for those who are following evidence-based medicine. Um, a better word for it, and a lot of virologists, uh, and um, what are they called, what's the word? infectious disease folks prefer community immunity which i think i like that too i actually read a book highly recommend it for those who want to learn more about the the history of vaccinations and risk versus benefit uh, it's called on immunity inoculation highly recommend it she talks about maybe calling it hive immunity because bees help each other out rather than herd immunity so what is herd immunity Let's call it community immunity, because that sounds wonderful. That is when enough of the population has immunity against a certain disease to protect those who do not have the immunity. It differs, the, amount, the percentage differs from disease to disease. So certain things, and I, I, I believe like polio needs 70% herd immunity. Like I might be making this stuff up, so don't quote me on this. Whereas MMR, or measles mumps, sorry, I, as he's getting his MMR next next visit, he got his polio today, he had his nine month checkup. Uh, that one requires more 80, 85% herd immunity. And the, and the moment that that herd immunity dips down, I mean, do you guys remember when uh, there was a lot of parents who decided not to vaccinate their children and then there were breakout of, breaks out, breakouts of mumps? That's what happens when we don't have herd immunity. So we have not reached herd immunity yet for COVID. We're getting closer. Why do we want it? It's protecting those who are the most vulnerable, those who can't get it. Your grandparents that have cancer, your children who are not old enough yet to receive, and when it comes to COVID, receive the vaccine. The immunocompromised folks, that's who we're protecting. Our elderly folks who can't get it, our again, our children. I can't emphasize that enough, our children. Okay, COVID itself, why we need boosters. Okay, so viruses, they mutate, mutate faster than rabbits, not mutate, they, they reproduce faster than rabbits. And if you can remember back in high school biology, the more you replicate, the more chances for a mutation in your genetic code. Viruses mutate really quickly because they're replicating very quickly, which is why we're seeing so many variants pop up. And it's important for us to achieve the community immunity so that it makes those variants less likely. But right now we're, ver we're battling Delta. And I just read, I don't have this in my work cited. There's a new one that came out in Africa, in Africa called C12. And that one is twice as contagious as any of the other variants. So we're looking at that coming down the rain. Yeah, and Delta variant. Thank you, Shannon. So we really are harboring to get community immunity before that. The fastest way to do it and the safest way to do it right now, and we'll talk about risk versus benefit. It's not without risk. I'm with you there is getting vaccinated, getting most of us, the ones who can get vaccinated, getting us vaccinated. The longer we wait for natural community immunity, the more likely more variants are gonna come up. I don't know if I said that, but it was worth saying again. 
the longer we wait, the more lives are impacted and the more lives lost. I looked up just the other day, I think you can look it up just by Googling it, four and a half million deaths worldwide. And I think the weekly average right now is 7,000. I don't think I have, I know 7,000 people. That's some people's complete Instagram followers. Not mine. Okay, understood. So when it comes to getting the vaccine, if you're young, yeah, you might not be affected by it. You might get it asymptomatically, but you are a carrier for it and their ripple effect that you're going to have. It's life or death. It could be life or death. Herd immunity. All right, was there anything else that I was gonna do? Herd immunity. Okay, let's talk about evidence versus experience. I've been finding, and first of all, give yourself some grace, give yourself some forgiveness. Our brains are not, have not caught up to, our brains, our biases, how our minds operate, have not caught up to modern day, right? So we are still very much tribal, instinctual that way. So if you were a caveman way back when, and your friend Larry ate these berries and then kicked the bucket, Let's say he ate a red berry and then he kicked the bucket and it was not fun to watch. You are probably gonna stay away from all red berries. That does not mean all red berries are going to kill you, right? But you're trying to protect yourself because you need to survive. Basic biological drive. Let's equate that with what's going on right now. This vaccine is not without side effects. It is not without risks. I am not here to tell you it is perfect. It is not. It's pretty close to perfect based on what the technology we have available is, but it is not perfect. You really have to take our critical thinking minds. We have to realize that we have biases and think bigger picture, right? So there is, there is risk of myo uh, myocardial infections, myocarditis, pericarditis, that there is, seems to be a correlation with this vaccine. Correlation does not mean causation. Just because one thing seems related does not mean that it is. That's what that means. Again, our minds look for evidence. A lot of the times, our minds draw evidence from our experience. So if you had a friend who had a reaction to a vaccine, you're more likely to not want that vaccine because that's the evidence you're drawing from. But remember, the smaller the sample size, <laughs> your friends, the less likely your friends are representing the diversity of the population as a whole, okay? Which is where we come in with evidence-based medicine, evidence-based decisions. And in a moment, I will go through that with you, how to find it, okay? To leave you with something to walk away with. Understanding your bias, right? So this is part of it. Oh no, my Instagram thing fell. Did I run out of battery? Pause, okay, I'm back, I'm so sorry, Instagram. I'm back, I'm back, okay. Well, that's a silly setup. Why would it shut off if I'm live? Anyways, you didn't miss anything. We're gonna talk about bias. There are lots of different biases. There are two that I've stumbled across recently that I really enjoy and it makes, it makes sense to me. So we have our heuristic bias, which means, where did I, I wrote it down somewhere. Where's my heuristic bias? Oh, I did not write it down. It's over here. Hold on, give me a second. Heuristic by availability heuristic. Thank you for your patience with me. People overestimate the importance of information that is available to them. So that's kind of what I was talking about, right? Your experience. A person might argue that smoking is not unhealthy because they know someone who lived to 100 and smoked three packs a day. That person likely is an outlier if we look at the population as a whole. The other thing that I think is coming, coming up often is anchoring bias. That's 
the bias in which you're over reliant on the first piece of information that you have found right so if you're scrolling through facebook and you see somebody have said um warning against the vaccine i i fainted right oh your your mind this is not your fault i'm not telling you it's your fault please forgive yourself your mind is automatically going to attach to that and think that's going to be the overriding truth compared to the broader information that we do have to keep you safe that's your mind trying to keep you safe that's your biological drive trying to keep you safe because larry died eating a red berry cool Awesome. So yeah, I thought those biases were cool. I guess there's like 20 of them, which is neat. So if anybody's interested in those, that was just a thing I found on Instagram. So not evidence-based, but I'm sure if I looked a little harder, I could find something similar in the psychology journals. Okay. Whew, how are we doing on time? Right on time. Go me. Okay. So Angelica, I'm scrolling through Instagram. I'm scrolling through Facebook there's news articles how do i know what to believe and not to believe so my rule of thumb is following the instructions that i had in undergrad when it came to researching and research papers if i could not use it in a research paper then i will not use it to obtain my own information okay all right here are my rules dot coms are not a reliable resource they would not hold up on your research paper. Dot orgs, I was taught you could, but technically my first website was a dot org and I could write whatever the hell I wanted on it. So I am ex dot orgs, okay? Unless it's a medical school. So like Yale is a dot org. That is reliable. Read your sources. Okay, so let's see here. Here's a great example. A friend of mine posted a tragedy vaccine story or reposted a tragedy vaccine story. And I went to that person's page and I read that story and there was no link to where she got it from. She literally wrote that in her Facebook. No external link. I would not consider that a reputable resource. If she had linked that to a case study that was written about that individual which happens we in the medical community if you can write a case study you are oh god it's awesome so you bet your ass if we've got the time which most of us don't anymore thank you covid i'm saying us i'm more i'm at home with ezzy so i am not on the front lines but my friends who are on the front lines are fucking exhausted excuse my french um i forgot where i was going with this okay so that would not be a reliable resource. There are graphics out there that are quoting scientific articles. I saw one that was anti-masking, quoting, quoting scientific articles, suggesting that masks don't do anything. Read those scientific articles. Try to find them. How do I find them? Google Scholar is great. All you have to do is type in Google, Google Scholar. Most of the, that stuff is evidence-based or coming from a medical school, something like that that you can trust. Google Scholar is awesome. Be weary of podcasts. Be weary of videos. Be weary of documentaries that don't cite their sources. It's very, they could very well be doctors. They could very well have a history working in medicine, but if they are not citing their sources, they could very well be making shit up. So I had a lot of people send me podcasts and videos without work cited. And I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to watch something for an hour if somebody is citing made up sources. Because I listened to one podcast and most of what they were saying was spinning scientific truth to meet their, meet their agenda. Um, okay. Does that sound good? So Google Scholar, great. If you don't under if you find a scientific article and you can't you don't know how to understand it, send it to me. Read past the title. First off, read past the title. That's a mistake I made the other day. Read past the title. You and read past the introduction. Read past the abstract. Read past the discussion. 
read it all. And if you don't understand something, ask somebody you trust. I'll volunteer. If I have time, I'll read it. I'll let you know what the shortcomings are, if it's a really good representation of the public or not. Okay. Okay, guys. Wrapping up. I don't villainize anybody who's questioning any medical technology. I think it is important that you do do your own research. I think it's important to have your hesitancies with something new. I think it's important to have your medical freedom. That being said, I'm giving you education on how to find your own resources, how to vet them, and how to determine whether or not what you're receiving is experience-based or evidence-based so that you can make not only the best decision for you, but for our community as a whole. I was a little bit livened up today. I'm very passionate about this because I, I do get very angry when people share resources that aren't evidence-based. It is risk versus benefit. Right now, the risks of contracting COVID, if you ask me, are vastly greater than the risks of receiving the vaccines. For most people, if you are immunocompromised, the risk of receiving vaccine is higher. And sometimes we don't know the risk. Sometimes we just have to take a risk. It's a risk getting in your own damn car every day. It's a risk hopping on an airplane to go on your vacation. For me, it's a risk to get on an amusement park ride. I said it earlier, I was in an amusement park accident. So I take, I respect risk. What I don't respect is passing around experience-based information and claiming it as truth. I'm not discounting anybody's experience. Your experience is valid. I'm not saying that you're making your experience up. I'm saying your experience is not reflective of the population as a whole. And it, when it comes to making decisions during a worldwide pandemic in which we have lost five, four and a half million of our brothers and sisters, we really need to look at the bigger picture. We need to look at the population as a whole. This should have been a TED talk. <laughs> I am all fired up. I'm also quite proud of myself. This was not easy to do. I'm happy to address comments and questions as long as they were kept kind in the comments. This IGTV and this Facebook Live will be available indefinitely. I will be happy to shift any shares that I had today as evidence continues to pile up. And yeah. Know that I'm with you all, and I love all of you, too. Awesome. All right, let's see if I can end this live, and it keeps... Also, I'm going to be putting this on my podcast, Fimboldened, as a special episode, because it's important. All right, happy Thursday, everyone. See you later.